After years of shooting down hopeful game revivals and allegedly laughing buyout offers out of the room, Nintendo's management has earned itself a reputation for being discerning and difficult to pitch to. In many instances, this approach has served the company well, but every so often, they have been known to unwittingly let a big business opportunity slip through their fingertips. In this video, I'll be going over several case studies of such a phenomenon. These are some of the big games that Nintendo turned down. 2008 was a year of great instability for the game industry. Rocked by the global financial crisis, many companies were forced to close their doors for good. Toys for Bob, meanwhile, was challenging themselves to invent a new IP during a period when the stakes were higher than ever. Their experiments combining RFID chips with homemade action figures resulted in a prototype that caught the attention of Activision's executives. They blended this original property with one Activision had not long since acquired, Spyro, resulting in the first Skylanders game. The majority of Activision's executives were apparently bullish on the proposed new title, but still sought to offset as much risk as possible. They directed Toys for Bob to court Nintendo for a potential co-publishing arrangement to spread the costs and employ their expertise. Believing it had the potential to succeed on their platform, the Wii, Activision wanted to offer Nintendo a chance to get in on the ground floor of their new product. After all, the two publishers already had a strong working relationship with a co-marketing deal already in place for the Wii generation. Paul Ritchie and other Toys for Bob staff presented their ideas to Nintendo of America in 2008 who were apparently impressed by the demonstration. Despite this enthusiasm, a risk-averse Nintendo declined to invest in this unproven new IP. The deal would have offered Nintendo a percentage in a venture that would go on to become highly profitable for Activision, spawning numerous sequels and topping over $3 billion in revenue. Skyland has helped spawn a Toys to Life craze throughout the 2010s that ultimately fizzled out in 2016. As sales slumped year on year, Activision cancelled its next major instalment. Speaking to Polygon in 2014, Richie recalled his incredulity at Nintendo's decision. Clearly, they have got properties well suited to this world. Why it is that they didn't rush in here will probably haunt them for the rest of their days. As the success of Skylanders exploded, Nintendo eventually did backtrack on their decision, at least to an extent. The two companies partnered for the Wii U version of Skylanders Superchargers, which introduced guest playable characters Hammer Slam Bowser and Turbo Charge Donkey Kong. Both had their own Skylanders figures, which could also function as Amiibo. For years, Sega's Yakuza series was associated chiefly with Sony platforms, beginning on PS2 and landing exclusively on them for a number of years. But as series creator Toshihiro Nagoshi has explained, this was not for lack of trying. After finally receiving the green light from Sega following multiple failed attempts, the team found themselves presenting their concept to console manufacturers, including Nintendo. The game was proposed to Nintendo, which was led by Satoru Iwata at the time, as a possible title for the GameCube. According to Nagoshi, however, Nintendo staff didn't see the potential in his game, along with every other platform holder. Even Sony turned down the initial proposal for Yakuza, as Nagoshi explained in an interview with CVG. For the market at the time, they thought it was too niche. They were worried it wouldn't sell, and I got quite a disappointing reply from them but I kept pestering them, and eventually they gave it a closer look. That's because they saw the passion I had for the game, rather than anything to do with whether or not it would sell. Ultimately, the Yakuza series did make its debut on Nintendo hardware years later, albeit in a limited form. The first two games were re-released together in HD on the Wii U, exclusively in Japan. This release, which was labelled by Nagoshi as an experiment to gauge the level of interest among Wii U players in the series, performed poorly. It was believed to have sold fewer than 2,000 copies during its first week on the market, leading the director to brand it as a huge failure in 2018. As the skateboarding game genre dawned in the 1990s, a number of different companies found themselves attempting to figure out how to best translate the burgeoning sport into video game form. For many publishers at the time, however, a skateboarding game remained a hard sell. 
To help grease the wheels, skating icon Tony Hawk was brought on to lend some credibility to the endeavour. Partnering with a PC developer in the late 90s, this very early concept for a skating game with the names of real-life pro skaters attached was pitched around to a variety of Western publishers. As Tony Hawk himself revealed in the 2020 documentary Pretending I'm a Superman, the Tony Hawk video game story, these initial endeavours were met with universal scepticism. Publishers were hesitant about the prospects of a skateboarding game, believing the sport to be unpopular and therefore unlikely to be the basis of a successful video game. While these unsolicited pitches went nowhere, there was one company that did take a proactive interest in Tony Hawk's early efforts and invited him to present a proposal, Nintendo. The Japanese game giant had caught wind of the project they'd been seeking to produce and met with him to see if it had potential as a Nintendo exclusive. As Hawk recounted, their ideas didn't get far and were unceremoniously shot down by their higher-ups, who ended up being similarly concerned about its sales potential. It was shortly after this venture fizzled out that he was contacted by a different party entirely, Activision. They had contracted the Californian studio Neversoft to create a prototype for a skating game. Upon playing the demo himself, Tony Hawk's impressions were very positive, complementing its intuitive and approachable gameplay. He soon agreed to come on board as the face of the game. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater released in 1999 to widespread acclaim and commercial success. It would go on to receive a myriad of sequels, raking in over $1.4 billion in revenue as of 2019. E3 2011 saw the reveal of the Nintendo Wii U, a first showing that also announced an infamously ill-fated collaboration. EA's John Riccatello took to the stage to pledge his company's support for Nintendo's system in no uncertain terms. The CEO bigged up their arrangement as an unprecedented partnership and told players to imagine a variety of EA franchises on the new console at their very best. Ultimately though, it was in the imaginations of Nintendo players that some of these games would remain. In spite of Peter Moore's insistence later that year that his company believed in the Wii U and its apparently extensive online features, EA's support for the system was limited to only four games, all of which were ports from other systems. The apparent turnaround from unprecedented partnership to a small series of ports that were commonly criticised for missing features has led many players to speculate that there was a fallout between the two parties after that initial 2011 announcement. While the dramatics of these events may have been overstated, there is some truth to the rumours after all. Sources close to the talks indicate that there were fundamental disagreements about the direction of the Wii U between EA and Nintendo. These concerned its online infrastructure, which EA apparently wanted to have a bigger hand in, and how powerful the system should be. One EA developer had asserted that the company was looking for a bigger piece of the pie when it came to the Wii U's online, and had even pushed for it to implement their EA Origin service in some form. Despite having initiated the discussions themselves, Nintendo was not willing to agree to some of EA's terms. For one, Nintendo hoped to keep manufacturing costs down, and this meant less powerful hardware than was initially discussed, an apparent point of contention for EA. Inside sources described the outcome as an amicable disagreement that left EA steadily backing off from some of their previous commitments out of concern for how successful the Wii U would be. In the aftermath of discussions breaking down, a number of potential EA games for the Wii U ended up being scrapped. Among those prototyped was a gamepad-centric version of SimCity and Crisis 3. One of the last nails in the coffin for EA support on the console came after attempts to get their Frostbite 2 engine running on it yielded some apparently poor results. Titles using the engine subsequently never appeared on the platform. These hiccups notwithstanding, Nintendo and EA are said to have entered talks again at the end of that generation in 2016, as the Nintendo Switch loomed. This time around, EA sought more reassurance that Nintendo would do more to court their typical audience on the console through its first party efforts. 
Sources privy to the negotiations said that EA wanted to have a hand in hardware sales yet again, proposing a FIFA Switch bundle be sold with their title packaged in. Nintendo turned them down once again, limiting their initial commitment to the system. Nintendo and Platinum Games have over the years cultivated a strong working relationship, beginning with their partnership over games like The Wonderful 101. However, there have also been a number of titles that Platinum was unable to receive the green light on when pitching to them. One notable title to slip through the cracks, according to former Platinum developers, was their fantasy action RPG epic, Scalebound. Sources claim that the title was pitched around to a variety of different publishers, and this included Nintendo themselves, early on in its lifespan. Already engaged in development on multiple other games with Platinum, Nintendo staff simply weren't interested in the initial concept and politely turned it down. Instead, it would end up being Microsoft who picked up the game, looking to produce more Japanese games for their then-upcoming system, the Xbox One. Following several rocky years of development, the ambitious project fell apart in late 2016 amid tensions between the two companies. Platinum would instead continue to partner with Nintendo on successful titles such as 2019's Astral Chain. Thank you so much for watching, please don't forget to subscribe for more videos just like this one. For more content from me, you can support the show at patreon.com slash liamrobertson, just like these kind people did.